Thanks for joining us. I'm Randall Bennett. With Friday's decision for the four Pirate Bay founders walking the plank in Sweden, it left a lot of people in the United States wondering, well, what does that mean for us? To talk about this, we bring in an intellectual property attorney. His name is Charlie Brown. He's with the law firm Ballard Spar and a couple other names. You know, this law firm name shows long. Charlie, thanks for being with us. Yeah, no problem. So let's, ta let's talk about what this actually means. You know, a lot of people, of course, it's in Sweden, so there aren't too many actual you know, case law implications for the United States. But you know, people are more aware that these people were charged $905,000 per, uh, you know, per, per founder, and then each person went to jail for a year. Could we see anything like that in the United States for people who are starting these BitTorrent websites? Well, yeah, as you stated, you know, what, what happens in other jurisdictions, uh, especially overseas, uh, there's no binding precedent on U.S. courts. Uh, but in the Pirate Bay case, they, they came to uh, what I think would be a very similar conclusion that a U.S. court would come to uh, if the same facts. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of the information that I've read about the Pirate Bay case, you know, the, the court held them as uh, liable for assisting infringement, which the analogous... Uh, you know, sort of charge over here would be an indirect infringement for copyright infringement. So in copyright liability, there's sort of two, two, uh, two approaches. There's direct infringement, which would be if you hosted, say, uh, the music file or the movie file on your own website right. and made it available for download. And then there's indirect infringement. And there's basically two primary prongs under indirect infringement, which include vicarious uh, liability and contributory liability. So these so, are, so if someone like this were in the U.S., they would still likely find a lot of the same uh, you know, amount of guilt or things like that. Right, right, under indirect, uh, under theories of indirect infringement. Uh, go ahead. So, so how does the general landscape look for, you know, things like this? I think people, you know, in the, la in the past few years, people have been used to getting nasty grams from the record industry or the music or the movie industry. And, you know, people are a little bit wary of downloading copyrighted materials. Obviously, if you're downloading, it's a crime. But, you know, our founders of these websites and things like this, do you see this kind of picking up as a way to go after these people? Or have most of these people even moved offshores? Well, I do, I do think <clears throat> that the, the ruling should put a lot of people on notice uh, in the U.S. that it's not just, at least it's just not about money anymore. Yeah. Uh, that, that I think the jail term is really going to open people's eyes. Uh, to get a feel for the current U.S. landscape, you've got to look back at sort of the history of in infringement, uh, copyright infringement in sort of the file sharing music movie downloading context. You remember there was mp3.com, yeah. which was shut down under uh, direct infringement because mp3.com was actually hosting, hosting yeah. uh, songs. Uh, but then you look at Napster. Uh, Napster was, well, at least the, the old version of Napster yeah. was shut down under, under both uh, theories of indirect infringement, both contributory and vicarious. Uh, for vicarious, it, you have to exhibit uh, control over over the infringement and also that you're profiting from it or your there's, yeah. there's revenue coming in and so uh, you know Napster you know was, was under that theory and also under a contributory theory you have to have knowledge that infringement's going on and that you were helping to facilitate it so Napster fell under both those uh, prongs of, of indirect infringement and then you go from Napster to Grokster yeah. uh, and Grokster they sort of you know I think designed their software around the Napster case. So they, you know, because Napster's problem was Napster had, uh, while they weren't hosting any sites, they were maintaining a server. Yeah. Right. They had a, they had a, a listing of all the songs that were located on various users' machines for download. Yeah. Rockster tried a, a more distributed approach where they had this software and they sort of just cut it out into the wild, and Grokster couldn't stop the network even if they wanted to, because uh, once it was out there, it was out there. So uh, the Supreme Court and Grokster. Uh, added an extra prong. They didn't address vicarious liability. They just stayed with contributory and sort of added an extra sort of sidecar to contributory liability, uh, that of inducement. Uh, because Grokster was billing itself yeah. out as an alternative to Napster. To Napster yeah. I mean, and, it's, it's, yeah. it's really a good point that, you know, people, I guess people have learned by now that if you're going to, you know, try and do copyright infringement in the U.S., you're probably going to come under something. Um, Charlie, we're about out of time, so thanks for being no, with us. No um, do you have a website where people can get a hold of you? Yes, uh, it's uh, ballardspar.com, B-A-L-L-A-R-D S-P-A-H-R.com Great, so you can check him out there. I'm Randall Bennett for TechV. Thanks for joining us. iTunes is the place to get us. See you later.